It's time for our main speech today. Here to do the introductions is our longtime member and former president, Carl Agee. Most of you know that Carl was a partner with Bogle and Gates. He then spent 15 years with Russell Investments, serving as their chief legal officer. Through that, he traveled the world, uh, was instrumental in, in developing their international business. More recently, when he retired from Russell, he joins Perkins Cooey. I don't know, attorney in the investments, back to being attorney. What's next? We'll find out. <laughs> Carl Eggy. Thank you. Thank you very much. Please join me in welcoming to the Rotary Club of Seattle the president of the Investment Company Institute, Paul Schott Stevens. You know, I, uh, I'm really thrilled to be here and quite, um, quite extraordinarily impressed with this club. And I, I, want, I want you to know if I were here in Seattle, I would be clamoring for membership. So I, I hope your membership drive will be tremendously successful. Um, I, I thank Carl for the very kind introduction, and I thank you for giving me an opportunity to address you, because I know this podium has hosted uh, so um, large a number of very, very distinguished folks. And I, it also provides me an opportunity to say thanks, in a way, to Rotary. Very early in my career, I was awarded a Rotary International Foundation Fellowship that took me to Germany for postgraduate studies. So. Thank you to Rotary for your personal confidence in me. I was asked to talk about the financial crisis, and I know that's still very much a topic uh, uh, that's in the news every day, and lots of aspects of it, and we'll have an opportunity to address those, I hope, in the Q&A. Um, but I, I wanted to focus in particular on its lingering after effects on investors. Um, I'm willing to bet that none of you individually needed me to come from that other Washington to tell you how painful the crisis has been because you've been there and you've lived through it. No investor has been immune from the turmoil, the volatility, and the severe declines that struck stocks and other assets in the wake of the worst financial crisis since the Great Depression. And we're all watching still nervously about uh, what will happen, how the crisis in the Eurozone will be resolved, uh, what the outcome will be of our own country's struggles with its fiscal policies, and whether the global economy will sputter or really um, its engine will catch fire. What's very interesting to me, though, from where I sit um, with respect to our mutual fund industry in the United States is the reaction of mutual fund investors to all of this chaos, particularly investors who are saving for retirement. And over and over, what mutual fund investors tell us is that that is their number one financial goal. That's why they use this product. At ICI, we've been studying mutual fund investors since the 1950s. We've conducted an annual survey on their behavior and their attitudes towards investing since 1987. Since the 1990s, we've been the major source of information about uh, IRAs and the 401k markets. We decided late in 2008, and cast your mind back to that point in time, um, in the depths of the bear market, that we needed to step up our research on retirement savers' actions and their attitudes in, in the face of these circumstances. So from that point on, we've been looking every quarter at the records of more than 22 million 401k accounts uh, to see whether investors are still contributing, whether they're taking withdrawals, whether they're reallocating their assets, and in short, sort of taking the vital signs of the 401k system. And we've added an annual survey now of public attitudes toward the 401k and other parts of our private DC retirement system. What we find is interesting and something of, I think you would expect. That is that it's true that the two bear markets of the last decade have made people much less comfortable with financial risk. In 1998, for example, one third of households told us, uh, these are households that have investments in the defined contribution plan or an individual retirement account, that they would be willing to take above average risk or substantial risk in return for commensurate financial returns. Since 2009, only one quarter of these households have said that. So it's down appreciably from one third to one quarter. It's also true, we find, that investors are behaving much more conservatively. In the Institute's survey at the end of 2010, we found that almost three out of every five households, that's 60% of households with financial assets had either increased their regular savings rate, had reduced their allocations to stocks, 
or had postponed their planned retirement age, and many households had made two or even all three of those changes. But while investors have become more conservative, they haven't panicked, and they haven't given up on investing. Instead, in each of these three years, we've also found that fewer than one in 25 participants in a 401k-type retirement plan quit contributing. That number that took the, the number that took any withdrawal at all from their plan was about the same, fewer than one in 25. And fewer than one in 50 took a hardship withdrawal. Finally, we do know that retirement savers have been rewarded for their commitment. And this may surprise you, but consistent savers who remained invested in 2008 were poised to benefit from the continued contributions and from the market upswing of 2009. As a result, and these are average figures, the 28% drop in 401k account balances that they suffered in 2008 was largely offset by a 32% gain in 2009. Now, that doesn't bring those numbers down to date, and there's been a lot of market volatility and change in the meantime. But it does say something about staying the course and the benefits of staying the course. You recall that in 2008, the press was absolutely full of stories about workers fleeing from their 401k accounts. There were people saying, you know, let's give up on 401k. Let's retire the defined contribution system. Now, that's obviously not the sentiment we've found when we've gone to talk to millions of investors. As Ed Bernard of T. Rowe Price, the chairman of our board for the past two years, likes to say, the people who invest have been a lot calmer than the people who just write about it. <laughs> the people who invest have stayed the course, by and large. So I've been here now, I don't know, at the podium for several minutes, and I've given you my punchline, so you might ask, where, where do I intend to go from there? Well, I'd like to explain a bit about why we've seen this cal relatively calm reaction in the face of all this financial chaos. And to do that, I want to step back in time a bit, actually way back, about 300 years to be precise. As I think you all know, financial history is littered with speculative bubbles, from Holland's mania about tulips to our own roaring 20s. But of all of these episodes, I find the story of John Law and the Mississippi Company to be especially interesting. Now, in part, that's because of the connection between John Law's escapades and my hometown of New Orleans. But the Mississippi bubble is also fascinating for its scale and its consequences and maybe some of the lessons it imparts, and those are the things I want to emphasize. So let me tell you briefly a little story. In 1715, after decades of extravagance and ruinous wars, France was close to bankruptcy. Louis XIV needed to borrow 8 million livres in gold from one of the leading financiers in Paris, and the legendary Sun King, in order to get that amount, had to pledge four times that amount in notes. Taxes were so ubiquitous in France at the time that couples wanting to marry or baptize their children would do so without the benefit of a priest because that would involve more tax levies. So into all of this came John Law, regarded today as one of the true fathers of modern finance. He was a Scotsman. He was best known for his prowess at the gaming tables, and he arrived in Paris in exile from Britain, where he had fled from prison and hangman's noose under sentence of death imposed after he killed a neighbor in a duel. For much of the following 20 years, he lived in Amsterdam. At that time, Amsterdam was the capital of world finance, where he studied the success of the Dutch East India Company and the rapid growth of the Amsterdam Stock Exchange, the world's first such exchange. He spent years thinking about how to combine commerce and credit into a, a powerful system for trade and economic growth. But what he needed to test out his theories was a country desperate enough to allow him to do so. He got his opportunity upon the death of Louis, the Sun King when Law's friend, the Duke d'Orléans, became regent to the five-year-old Louis XV. So, with Orléans' help, Law founded a new bank. The bank began issuing legal tender when the regent decreed that the bank's notes could be used to pay taxes. And over the next few years, Law took over tax collections, wiped out hundreds of levies, replaced them with the world's first income tax, gained control over the mints where the coins were made, and he launched his greatest creation, the Mississippi Company. To the regent, Law pledged to refinance all the royal debt, accepting lower interest rates on the government notes he took in in payment for Mississippi shares. In return, the company was granted monopoly control over France's colonies in the New World. Shares of the Mississippi Company were sold to the public. Investors were promised riches on a scale that Spain and England were extracting from their colonies. Louisiana, and many of you 
may have traveled there, but it's not what was hailed to be in song as a new wonderland endowed with gold and silver mines and pearl fisheries. So what resulted was one of the greatest speculative booms in history. Everyone in France, from royal princes to servants, wanted to own Mississippi stock. Shares issued for 500 livres skyrocketed in price to 10,000. The Paris street where the company was headquartered became an open-air market. An English clerk observed that dukes and duchesses, quote, sell estates and pawn jewels to purchase Mississippi. And the term millionaire was coined to describe the newly wealthy. Well, you all know what came next. Louisiana had no gold. The governor of Nouvelle Orleans reported that they were actually just four houses that had been built, not the 800 that law claimed, as half of the emigres sent there either died or went hurriedly back to France. So the cycle of easy credit and skyrocketing shares fueled inflation. The Bank Royale, the new name of the bank, had scarce reserves of gold and silver to back the paper money supply. One after another, Law's desperate measures to prop up the Mississippi stock and halt capital flight failed, and the crash came. Riots broke out. Mobs fought to get gold or silver for their notes. Suspicion and disorder reigned as the government launched a campaign to root out speculators and profiteers. And quickly, by 1720, Law's system was undone. France's financial institutions were ruined. As historian Neil Ferguson wrote, quote, Law's bubble and bust put Frenchmen off paper money and stock markets for generations. They also set the royal family on a course of fiscal mismanagement that helped trigger the French Revolution some 70 years later. Now, I single out Law because of his connections to my birthplace, because this story really is so colorful, and because of the historic impact of his scheme. But this is hardly the only example. Indeed, one of the surprise bestsellers of this year uh, was a thick book, chock full of dense charts titled, This Time is Different, Eight Centuries of Financial Folly. In it, two economists examined data from 66 countries and hundreds of banking, sovereign debt, currency, and inflation crises to tease out the common factors, the factors common to what Charles McKay, the 19th century historian, described as, quote, extraordinary popular illusions and the madness of crowds. Now, the key point of their book, the authors say, is simply this. We have been here before. Every crisis is different, but there are remarkable similarities among them. So how does this current crisis stack up against the Mississippi bubble, and what lessons does John Law offer? Well, first is the role of government policy in triggering and fostering boom and bust cycles. Law was able to rise so quickly because he worked for an absolute ruler who could override the councils of state. Yet even in a democracy, public policy can go badly awry and fuel speculative, speculative bubbles. Most analysts agree that policy errors in no small part fueled the latest financial crisis. A decade-long push by government to promote home ownership led many lenders to ease the terms of mortgage lending. As a result, by some estimates, in 2007, 27 million mortgages, half of all the mortgages in the United States, were subprime or non-traditional in their terms. Banking regulators, for their part, failed to prevent the wholesale deterioration of underwriting standards for mortgage lending, and that, too, is a crucial policy error. The second factor that links Mississippi in 1720 to America today is the central role of monetary policy. John Law has been recognized by many notable economists, from Adam Smith to John Kenneth Galbraith, as a master of monetary theory. He just didn't know when to stop. Now, can't we say the same thing of the central banks in the United States and Europe and the long credit and asset boom that so much of the world enjoyed during the past decade, or for that matter, of the leaders of financial institutions who rode the bubble without looking ahead to the inevitable collapse. You know, for some reason, economic booms invite party metaphors. Central bankers are supposed to know when to, quote, take away the punch bowl. CEOs of financial firms are said to be playing musical chairs. They are obliged to stay on their feet so long as the music is playing. But taxpayers like us and shareholders of their companies and of mutual funds count on government and business leaders to know exactly when to end all the fun. The trouble is, neither group exhibits such perfect timing. A third parallel was that many voices offered warnings of a breakdown in law's system, 
but too many people were caught up in the euphoria to pay any heed. In 1719, the ever-skeptical Voltaire wrote to a fan friend, have all you gone crazy in Paris? And the English author Daniel Defoe said the French economy was, quote, run up on a piece of refined air. Now today, as you know, just go in any bookstore and you'll see the shelves are groaning with volumes of, I told you so. But at the time when it mattered, when bankers could have turned away subprime loans, when regulators could have raised capital standards, when credit rating agencies could have quit slapping AAA ratings on suspect paper, the warning signs were largely ignored. Confidence fed confidence until the bubble burst. There are many other parallels, and yet there's one important contrast. Remember, Neil Ferguson said that the Mississippi bubble, quote, put Frenchmen off stock markets for generations. Yet the research we've done at the ICI finds that mutual fund investors, particularly retirement investors, are for the most part holding steady. Even over the past few months, with the unprecedented downgrade of the U.S. government's long-term credit rating, the remarkable volatility in stock markets and the ongoing crisis for sovereign debt in Europe, our recent data on flows into and out of mutual funds show that fund investors are not fleeing equity funds. In fact, despite a rapid increase in stock market volatility in August, the vast majority of mutual fund investors stayed the course with their investments. What accounts for this? And we should think about this. Why is it that that is the case? Remember, these are judgments being made across our nation by 90 million mutual fund investors. So they, rep they, they reflect, if you will, a consensus view. To me, the two key differences are in the investors and in the investing vehicle. Now, clearly, we all know greed and euphoria have not been bred out of the human race over the past three centuries. Today's Americans can chase a tech boom or leverage themselves into a house that they can't truly afford based on the conviction that this time is different. But as average Americans have in the past generation assumed greater control over and responsibility for their retirement savings, views about investing, I think, have evolved. Our retirement savers are well aware that they are in this for the long term. They're investing literally for the rest of their lives. They're not going for a killing. With that attitude, investors realize that they have to make plans and stick to them. Indeed, our mutual fund members tell us that investors are telling them, this market is volatile, I have to save more. They recognize that saving is the foundation. Now, that long-term approach is, is reinforced by a plethora of educational materials. But just as the attitude of fund investors is different, so is their chosen vehicle. Mutual funds offer a diversified, professionally managed portfolio that's closely regulated. Investors receive thorough disclosure about their portfolio. And while fund investors aren't immune to the market shocks, they are well protected against the falsified returns of a Bernie Madoff or the high leverage that many hedge funds take on. Now, fund protections weren't always so good. In the roaring 20s, investment funds were known as the most notable people, uh, notable piece of speculative financial architecture. Their assets soared from $1 billion in 1926 to $8 billion just three years later, just before the stock market crash. The crisis led to the greatest reform in of finance in U.S. history, and mutual funds weren't exempt. After fully a decade of study, Congress passed key legislation in 1940 that laid the foundations for this industry. In addition to the of detailed framework of strict regulation, the statute gave fund advisors a simple charge. Put your investors' interests above your own. This a fiduciary duty has helped build the trust that Americans have exhibited today in the mutual funds that manage their investments. We see that trust in their ongoing dedication to saving and to investing for their future. And I thank you all for being fund investors, despite all the challenges that today's markets pose. Speaking for our industry, preserving that trust is absolutely imperative. It's something that we never take for granted, and we know we've got to earn that trust each and every day, notwithstanding the conditions in the markets in which we invest. That's our commitment. It certainly is our mission. With that, let me say thank you. It's been a great pleasure, and I hope there's some time still left to take some questions.
Excuse me. Could you yes. talk about the uh, somewhat disturbing article in the New York Times yesterday about ETFs, leveraged ETFs, and the high-speed trading impact, and what, if any, activity your organization has in the governance and control of that set of products? Thank you very much. Yes, I did read the article. It was a, a very prominent article in the Times yesterday and focuses on one particular kind of ETF, uh, which leverages its position to multiply um, uh, changes in, in uh, the indexes in which, which uh, it invests. Uh, it's been the subject of some scrutiny of late, that particular product, particularly as to whether in, uh, late in the market, in the da daily trading cycle, it exacerbates trends that are there in the market. And I know that, that the Securities and Exchange Commission is, is considering that question. Um, I don't necessarily have a view about it because I think it, 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 the empirical uh, issue is yet uh, somewhat in doubt, um, perhaps a little bit more than, than Andrew Ross Sorkin's article yesterday would suggest. But I would say that, that um, market structure and how markets behave should be a concern to all of us. And um, markets have evolved very rapidly. In fact, they're evolving all around the world to accommodate uh, new forces. We don't have dealer firms that, with committed capital making markets and securities any longer. They just don't exist. We have instead high-frequency traders that are trading through uh, complicated algorithms um, uh, and, and who are trying to um, extract very small gains um, from stocks as they're traded throughout the, the day and typically to end the day flat with no money at risk in the market. Um, that has excited <clears throat> a good deal of controversy about whether they are good providers of liquidity or whether they are, in, in fact, exciting the volatility that we see in the markets. Uh, and I, that is also a question that's under active consideration in Washington. Of course, the overlay of all this are all these macro forces that we see that are driving investor sentiment. It seems every day there's a new judgment about whether Europe is going to be able to get its problems in, in hand. And we all know that Washington is, is not exactly a pillar of confidence building for investors either. So you've identified, I think, a very important issue. I would like to see markets work for average investors and work very effectively. Uh, most of them are in markets through funds like ours, and that's why we're very much involved with this debate and putting forward our own analysis and thoughts to the Securities and Exchange Commission. We have a question over here. Yes, sir. Hi, thanks for your speech. Um, for individual investors, uh, over the last several years, they might have heard um, about mutual funds in large cap equities, international. Uh, now investors are hearing more about market neutral funds, long, short. Could you talk a little bit about uh, the regulatory framework or protective nature from the 1940 Security Act to give people confidence and comfort that there is some oversight? and that these aren't just um, hedge funds run amok to execute whatever strategy might be their fancy? It, it's an excellent question. And, and let, let me start by certainly acknowledging that, that many mutual fund managers are adopting investing strategies that we hadn't seen in earlier years, um, giving you exposure to different kinds of asset classes, implementing different sort of investment theories. They think of this as an alternative investment category. And, and that's how I think investors ought to think about these kinds of funds. Um, I think classic theory would tell you they may have a place in your portfolio, but it's probably going to be a distinctly minority position balanced out by a lot of other asset classes that are more traditional, long-only type funds that you invest in. So I'd, I'd, I'd put that out there first. It would be a mistake for anybody to go 100% into these, any of these alternative strategies. Allocating your assets and rebalancing your portfolio is, I think, essential for everyone. That having been said, um, you know, the, the, many of these strategies are, are employed through the use of derivatives. The SEC now has undertaken a comprehensive look at how funds use derivatives, and derivatives present new issues um, for the 1940 Act and for our regulations because they effectively can allow certain kinds of leverage that Classically speaking, the act would limit or prohibit. Um, uh, so there's now a big regulatory proceeding. A large uh, uh, concept release, as it's called, was issued by the SEC. Our members are looking at that and will be commenting. 
Um, I think typically in our world, derivatives are used to hedge risk. And um, for that reason, we don't want a regulatory regime which would preclude or prohibit people from using them. In other investing schemes, they're used to multiply risk. That's typically not what you'd find in a mutual fund form. I hope that answers your question. There's a lot of fear and anger out there in everyone. I saw a fascinating poll yesterday that said that 75% of the people polled supported increasing taxes on millionaires. There was all this talk of 250,000 a year and it never got traction. But when you go up to a million, check these two numbers out. 57% of the Republicans supported taxing millionaires and 55% of the Tea Party people supported taxing millionaires. Given the anger and the frustration, and given the word you use, the greed word, right. is there anyone there to introduce a level of rationality? Um, you know, we, we always are in search of that in Washington. Um, sometimes, it's a, <laughs> it's, sometimes it's a vain search. Look, uh, I, I, you know, I think the, um, the, the, there is a lot, of, there's a lot of anger, there is a lot of frustration. Um, um, the, the, the Occupy Wall Street protesters, in, in a sense, are reflective of very difficult economic times. They're also, in a sense, reflective of a strong populist antagonism that is as old as the republic towards large financial institutions. It's not surprising to me that those, many of them young people, no doubt really concerned about their own future, um, are there raising their voices, and it's quite understandable. Um, I would say that, that I think it's simplistic to blame the crisis on a few financial institutions and their greed, although greed was there and mistakes of colossal errors of judgment were made by leaders in the financial world. But that's too incomplete a picture. Um, I would also say that the idea of taxing millionaires may sound really appealing, but we should be under no illusion we're not going to solve our fiscal problems by taxing millionaires. The fact of the matter is that you could take every penny that every millionaire makes from now for the rest of their lives and you wouldn't really make much of a dent on the deficits that we're, that we're um, uh, 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 racking up uh, in Washington. You know, this, this uh, super committee that's been appointed is trying to find about a trillion and a half dollars which would reduce the projected um, deficit over the next um, 10 years from 24 trillion to 22 and a half trillion. And they're having real problems doing that. Um, so we have, we have a, a serious challenge uh, in government. I hope pressures will be put on all sides, the Occupy Wall Street folks, the Tea Party folks, and everyone in between. But we have to be realistic about this. Um, uh, I think everyone should do their part. I do think fundamental tax reform should be a part of this. Um, but the tax on millionaires is more of a feel-good tax than a real remedy for the problem that we have. Seattle Rotary Online is made possible in part by a grant from First Choice Health, working with the Washington Health Information Collaborative to use technology to bring better health care to patients throughout the Pacific Northwest. First Choice Health, 